Hey, a couple things that I want to tell you about real quick that is exciting for our church. It is us moving forward, guys. And I'm going to tell you something. As long as I'm the lead pastor here, I'm always going to lead forward because I think that that expands our influence. With more influence means more people, more disciples that we can make. And, guys, we can do everything we can to do what God's called us to do until Jesus comes back. Would you agree that's important? I do, too. So our elder team has been praying over the last year uh, to, to, to hire uh, Boomer Harris. Uh, he's going to come on staff at Thousand Hills Cowboy Church. Not real sure what the title's going to be, but it is going to heavily involve our community groups and our small group Bible studies to create more, uh, to work on uh, 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 Bible study and direction for what we're teaching, knowing what we're teaching, and hopefully create smaller groups. This is a two-fold deal. One, is because we believe that people need to be more deeply in the Word of God, and we need to make sure we have some good structure there in order to create an atmosphere for Bible study. We've done them since our beginning, so it is in our DNA. If you're not involved in a Bible study, I hope that you will find a community group to get involved with, but there's going to be more in the coming year uh, as we train teachers and equip them to be able to teach. Uh, of course, Boomer is a team leader of our herd team, and they are doing an excellent job. Uh, one of the things and one of the focuses that I hope we'll focus on in the next year is making sure that all of our groups are family-oriented, that they're uh, I don't believe in segregation in the church, so I, I realize that's what they do up the road. They have old people here, uh, young people here, middle-aged people here, children here, youth here. I, I, don't, I don't like that. I don't think that's biblical. I think it's unbiblical. I think when you look to the Bible, we see family-oriented. That's why I like when your kid's in here and he's screaming and junk, he's fine. Okay, listen, parent, if you're new here today and your kid starts talking in the middle of the deal, that's cool. I don't worry about that. If you're the type of person that wishes kids had shut up, go to the church where they shut them up, okay? It, it don't matter to me. It don't matter to the people here that you leave. So if your kid acts out a minute, hey, calm him down, take your time, don't get upset, and don't feel like people staring a hole at you, okay? I want them people to leave, not you. So it's cool. So everything we do here, we want to be family-oriented. All of our, our community groups, our herd groups, parents, you're invited to stay with your teenagers to discuss the Word of God. We, you're, you are responsible for those guys, not me, not this church. You are responsible in educating them. So if we can help you along in your education on the Word of God and them too at the exact same time, we want you involved. Cow kids, parents, same thing. We want you involved. Uh, if neither one of those fit in your schedule and you're going to a community group down the road, feel free to bring your kids, okay? That's we want. We don't want seclusion because the Word of God transcends all age groups. If you're 80 or 8, if you are in Christ Jesus, meaning you're saved, you're born again, the Word of God transcends all the barriers that we think that we've got, okay? That's, that's come from government-run schools and all. I mean, that's where the, all this segregation has come from. So I'm not going to get on that soapbox for a minute, but just to tell you that Boomer is going to help us move forward in those community groups. So I want to just introduce you, if you already know Boomer, he preached here a few, uh, about a month ago, did a great job. His wife, Megan, Megan, I can't get it out. I about said mega. Megan, and then, uh, of course, their baby Lorelai. And guys, be praying for these guys. Uh, coming and working where I'm the supervisor is kind of a scary deal. Uh, Boomer, of course, will be, uh, he'll, he'll be bivocational. He's not quitting his other job or anything. He's still going to sell feed. But uh, guys, be praying for them. Encourage them. If he can help you out in any way, if you need direction on where to go to a community group, he's going to be the guy. And as we create more, he's going to be the guy. And I'm sure he's going to be talking about it uh, over the coming months, weeks and months, about how we can get it once we kind of get our brain around what all we're going to be trying to do. But get involved in a small group Bible study, guys. They are vital to our church. So, hey, I want to pray for you guys. All right, Lord, we come to you right now, and we thank you. Oh, thank you for Boomer. I thank you for Megan and Lorelai here, God. I pray that you would just be with them in a mighty and a powerful way. You would use them in ministry, and, Lord, that you would be honored, that you would be blessed blessed by the things that we do at Thousand Hills Cowboy Church as we continue to know you and make you known. God, help us never lose to sight what it is we've been called to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, another thing I want to tell you about, and I know you probably come to hear preaching, but this is, pre this is uh, everything I do has always got a little preaching deal in it. A lot of you have heard the rumor that we're talking about expanding, and we, that's true. We are talking about expanding. 
Uh, we're talking about ad, uh, adding additional worship space. Uh, one reason is is to bring our 8.30 gathering, our 10 o'clock gathering together so we can worship collectively. Also, we're just cramped, guys. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. It's just, it's elbows to you know what us, okay? So, um, it, it's everybody is right on top of everybody. We need some more space. We need some breathing room. Our air conditioners are having trouble. The fans are whipped up. But we just need some space. Now, listen to me before I tell you the next deal. I don't know how we're going to pay for this, so don't even ask me that silly question. I have no clue. But when we built this building, I had no clue how we were going to pay for it. I'll just be honest with you. I had no clue. I think we paid this thing off in three years, guys. We own everything you see. And so, you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I just know we've got to do something in order to move forward. Now, listen, anybody ever started a cult before? Raise your hand if you've ever started a cult. What's the first thing you wanted them to do, Kenny? First time you jumped on them, not say, don't say, don't book. What, <laughs> what, what do you want them to do? Respond what you, what you want them to do and make them move what? Forward. That's the first thing you want out of that young horse is just to move forward. Now listen, sometimes to make them move forward, it takes a whole heck of a lot, but I want to see forward momentum on that sucker. At this church, you will always, always see forward momentum. Now listen to me. I really doesn't matter to me if we build a building or not. I told our leadership that Tuesday morning. I'm not into trying to build a cathedral for myself to say, hey, look what we've done. Ain't we great? Pat ourselves on the back. I'm cool with not building anything. But hear me. We will still move forward. If we've got to go to three worship gatherings, if we've got to go to four worship gatherings, where I get up, play the drums, play the bass, guitar, because the band leaves because they say we ain't doing four, We'll do whatever it takes to reach as many people as possible in Lawrence County because I believe that is more gospel influence that we can reach the world. So realize, guys, that it ain't about being puffed up and talk about being the largest church in Lawrence County. It's about reaching as many people as possible. So stay tuned. We've got a team on that. They're praying through that. They're working on plans, working on how much it's going to cost. We will come together and call it a special called church conference for uh, all of our members to kind of educate you, give you an opportunity to ask questions like, how are we going to pay for this? You know, all those real good questions. But I promise you, it's coming forward, and we're going to move forward. We're going to blaze a trail uh, in the name of Jesus, no matter what it is that we end up doing uh, to move forward. Amen? Amen? Let's talk about moving forward today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to talk about the crazy times that we're living in. Let me ask you a question. You ever heard the phrase, cheer up, things could get worse? Yeah, that's always a doozy, ain't it? When life is miserable and somebody says, cheer up, things could get worse. What does Murphy Law say? It does. You've been there, ain't you? Well, we opened up a few weeks ago, started uh, in 2 Timothy, and, and guys, so far it seems like gloom and doom. And it kind of is. But for those that are in Christ Jesus, guys, we don't live in gloom and doom. We live in victory. Because we know ultimately that Jesus is on the throne and it does not matter what happens in the world around us when it is going down, that Jesus is the source of our joy. And since He is, when it seems like things are going down, the church is going to go up and we are going to be about knowing Him and making Him known no matter what's going on around us. And so I want to encourage you before we read these words, because just when you think it can't get no worse, it does in our passage today. I want you to be thinking, but for the believer in Jesus Christ, if we will hold tight, if we will hold fast to the things that God has said, guys, no matter what happens to us, no matter what goes on in our life, we will be able to claim victory in Jesus' name. All right, let's look at our text together today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 1. It says, realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, 
treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding, listen to this, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. Now, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through the faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you today, and we pray, Lord, we would be able to live in victory and joy and be overcomers because of your promises to your church, God. I pray, Lord, that the world around us is going to pot, that the church will stand up, that we will call right, right, and wrong, wrong, and we would not be ashamed of this gospel. Fill us, Lord God. Fill us up today with your spirit, Lord, with your word. I pray that in everything that we do, we will magnify the name of Jesus and not worry about all the stuff that doesn't matter. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work in this place. You are welcome here to do what it is that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, verse 1 is the key to this deal. Now, realize, background again, is that Paul is in prison. He knows his time is up. Uh, He's about to die. They're going to take his life because he has preached the gospel. They've told him to shut up. They've done all sorts of things to him. But he continues on. It does not matter to him because he realizes, guys, that his life is on the bottom side of importance compared to those that need the gospel. He doesn't care what they're going to do to him. And guys, I'm going to tell you something. There is a freedom in not caring about the things of this world. There is a freedom in saying, you know what? It doesn't matter what they do to us. It doesn't matter what they say about us. We are going to be about Jesus Christ's business. We are going to preach the word. If it offends you, I'm sorry. Don't be mad at me. Be mad at God because he's the one that breathed them. He's the one that inspired them. He's the reason why we've got them right here uh, in this Bible today. And guys, I could easily get up here and preach you a flowery message. I could tell you a 45-minute story and then hopefully tie it in with some scripture that I found the other day when I was halfway reading and say, God bless y'all, and all y'all walk away and you feel like that I filled you full of uh, of rainbows and unicorns. But guys, that's not what we're going to do. We are going to address the situations in which we live so you can be prepared for what is going to happen. Verse 1 is the key to this whole chapter. Look at it with me real quick. Realize this, that in the last days, difficult times, and look what he says, will come. Do you hear me? I don't mean like hangnail type will come. I don't mean like somebody makes fun of you because of your faith will come. I don't mean that somebody uh, unfriends you on Facebook because you post a scripture type uh, will come. I'm talking about where people is going to get in your business and there's a good chance that you're liable to shed some blood for the gospel. That's what I'm talking about. That's what Paul's talking about. And realize, folks, that we are slowly losing our freedoms in the United States of America. But guess what's going to happen? The church is going to rise to the occasion. Some of y'all will be there, some of you will not be there. 
but the church is going to rise. And I don't want y'all to be fooled, guys. I can make y'all walk away liking me, loving me, tell you all kinds of funny stories and keep you rolling in the floor, floor laughing the whole time and us triple and quadruple and bu even bust out the seams even more. But I ain't going to do it. I'm going to get up here and I'm going to use my time wisely with what it is God has showed me in the Word of God to read and to teach and to preach so y'all won't be fooled. Two questions come to mind when I look at this verse. The first one is this. What does Paul mean by the expression of the last day? I think it has a couple meanings. It could apply to the entire time from the first coming of Jesus and his ascension after he was dead and buried and resurrected, his ascension back into heaven, and his second coming. It also could mean the unique periods of time of testing that will occur in different times and different places. And then obviously, for, for certain, it could mean the, the few weeks, months, and years preceding to the Lord's return. But hear this. Paul, I believe Paul thought that he was living in the last days. And just think about it. Since the Lord's ascension into heaven, when he said, Hey, I'm coming back. It's going to look just like this. I want you to know we have been living in the last days since Jesus has returned to heaven. So it's been a, another day closer every single day. So are we living in the last days? Yes. Then he gives us a clue. This is what the last days are going to look like. And the word, word, word that he uses right here when it says difficult times, it can also be translated terrible, and it occurs only one time. This is crazy. It occurs only one other time in all the New Testament. This, this word for difficult or terrible times. And it goes all the way back to Matthew t uh, chapter 8 where there's two demon-possessed men, okay? And it's describing what these men were like. They were living among the tomb tombs and they were wild and they were crazy and they were violent. Uh, they were uncontrollable. They lived amongst the tombs, you know, a graveyard. And this particular word is used to, de to describe what the end times will look like. It will be fierce. It will be violent. It will be dangerous. It will be frightening. Here's another way to put it. The in the last days, savage times will come and men and women will cast off all moral restraint and society will begin to disintegrate. Let me ask you a question. Does that look like the world you live in right now? <laughs> and over it's, Guys, there wasn't no crickets chirping right there. You can look. you got eyes. Some of you have discernment. You can see. So Paul warns Timothy, look, when I am gone as an old man, and they're going to take me out here before long, when I am gone, realize that it will get worse before it gets better. And folks, I am here to warn you not to blow sunshine in the right or wrong places. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to tell you things are going to get worse before they get better. But for those that are in Christ Jesus, we have great joy because we have great purpose and we know who is on the throne no matter who is in politics. No matter who controls this world, no matter what is going on in society, we can have great joy because we have been given a great purpose to know Christ and make Him known. So what do we do? Do we go hide off in a cave somewhere? Absolutely not. We let our light shine before men. We get vocal. We tell people the reason why we believe like we do. Will people hate you for it? You betcha. I promise you they will. He tells Timothy, hold tight. Terrible times are coming. And it's going to be rough. Anybody ever rode a horse before and somebody said, this horse don't buck? <laughs> Kid broke. Some of you done it to somebody on purpose, right? Hopefully, you're the type of friend that would say, hey man, this horse has got a little catch to him. Hopefully, you would be one that would say, you know what? You need to hold tight to this sucker because there is a good chance that he will launch you out of the solar system. Or try to kill you, mash you into something. 
Paul is telling Timothy, hold tight. Life is about to buck. You better get you a good seat. As a matter of fact, you better get you a night latch. You know that little strap right there around the swell to grab a hold and pull yourself down the, tight, uh, the saddle and get yourself as deep as you can because guess what? It is coming. If you've ever owned a horse like that that's a little fresh in the morning, you know that. You're ready. You're warned. Folks, be forewarned that this is coming. It is going to happen. And I know I don't sell a best-selling book, and I know I don't have that old crap, uh, grin, crap-eating grin on my face all the time that makes everybody feel funny and suspicious at the same time. I know that that's not me. And I'm sure you're watching somebody on TV that makes you feel good about yourself. Guys, that's not what the Bible tells us to do. Look at these crazy times. Look how they're defined right here in verses 1 through 5. The first uh, verses of 2 Timothy offer a sure enough definition of crazy times. And really it's a short version of what Romans chapter 1 tells us in about 18 through 32. Look at some of these. It says, verse 2, Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossip, without self-control, brutal, hater of God, haters of God, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And look at this, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. First thing that we see is a total rejection of God a total rejection of God people love everything else other than God and guys then we see a total breakdown of society what it is that people will do we see a moral collapse lovers of money conceited without love towards others boastful proud unforgiving conceited not lovers with what is good some of your translations say and then we see this breakdown of society they're treacherous rash slanderous brutal disobedience parents abusive without self-control in some of your versions guys that last phrase means that in the end anything will go and i'm telling you we are headed that way i'm sure that we won't be surprised at some time where you can actually marry your sister or marry your kid or marry your dog, or marry somebody, the neighbor's mule. I'm telling you, you think it's bizarre, tell them how bizarre some of our laws are now back to the generations before us. I guarantee you, if you could go back four or five generations and say a man would be able to marry another man and everything would be all right, they'd say, no, 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 no. Now we say, well, marry your horse, and people's like, no, 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 no. I'm telling you guys, it is just morally, our world is just going. Because we don't care about the things of God. We don't care what God has said. And one day we'll be able to do anything we want to. The next time the neighbor's dog craps in your yard, you'll go over and shoot him. Not the dog, but the neighbor. And say to the police, well, in my heart... I felt like, because our very laws, guys, that govern this land are based off God's laws. What happens when we just say, well, I think we ought to govern ourselves on our feelings. Guys, you've got mass chaos. You have no law. What he's talking about is, is an anything goes, a no rules, no moral absolutes, no restraints of any kind. And you say, well, golly, pastor. Well, I ain't even got to the bad news yet. Look at verse 5. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. And he says, avoid such men as these. The word form means something like having an outward appearance. Meaning, guys, when these times show up, people will grab a hold of religion. They will want to embrace religion. Some of you want to embrace religion. You've got the outward sign but you deny its power because while you embrace religion, you never embrace Jesus. 
While you, while you embrace some of the rules and regulations of what you think is in the Bible, you never embrace the Savior and let Him begin to work in you and work the inside out. You're trying to work the outside in, and it just don't work like that. It is a form of godliness that is not godliness whatsoever. It is man's invention called religion. And it is not being in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. It's never a time where you have repented of your sins. You have turned to Jesus and you, see, you look at everything in your world through the eyes of Jesus. No, it is church attendance. It is going through the religious steps, if you will. People will be religious for religion's sake. And they won't know Jesus. They will join churches. They will join religious organizations. They will be baptized. They will attend services. They will sing. They will praise. They will give. They will go through the motions, but their hearts will not be in it because their hearts will never be changed by Jesus Christ. They will deny, listen, they will deny the very power that they profess to believe. And when it gets hot, guess where they're going? Out. They will be gone. And they embrace this postmodern, if you will, religion that allows them to do anything, to believe anything, to endorse anything, and to live in any way they choose as long as it makes them happy. That's what he's talking about. That's what we're talking about. They will say we do not need to be bound by a Bible that was written thousands of years ago. We shouldn't be bound by that. Guys, it's not far-fetched. There's preachers that preach that today in so-called churches. They don't believe in the authority of the Word of God. Hmm. Notice how Paul says we're not even to respond, how, or excuse me, how we are to respond to these false teachers in verse 5. He says what? Avoid such men as these. We have got to watch who we let speak into our lives, folks. I'm telling you. You watch me. You watch the preacher you turn on your TV. You watch the preacher or listen, as you, that you listen to on the radio. You watch other supposed Bible teachers that write books, that print videos, that do music, that have movies, any type of anything where someone is pouring into you. Just because they sell it at the Christian bookstore, don't make it biblical. Do you hear me? You better make sure it lines up with the Scriptures. Watch out. How do we respond to those leaders? We avoid them. When I see Joel Osteen on the TV, I don't listen to the sucker. I avoid him because he is preaching a gospel that is not found in the Bible. That may ruffle your feathers. Good. Watch out for him. Look at verse 6. He says, among them. This is just, I mean, this fits right here. For among them are those who enter into households, hmm. captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. Look at verse 9. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus's and Jambres's folly was also. Verse 6 through 9 describes how these false teachers spread their lies. First of all, they pray on the weak people, the weak-minded. This word right here can be translated as silly or unstable. Uh, and, of course, it's, it's saying women, but this doesn't describe all women, but rather a certain class of women who are usually or unusually gullible. But this principle here, the principle of this Scripture, applies to all both men and women, the principle of the Scripture applies both to men and women who are generally easily led and easily confused. Realize that these false teachers are nothing new. Paul cites this Janus and this Jambres, and, and, and by Jewish tradition, that's what they believe were the names of the magicians that opposed Moses back in Exodus. Whenever you began to look and see who these cats were, they opposed Moses, and this is tradition 
uh, of the Jewish people and what their names were because when Moses, uh, I don't know if you remember, whenever, uh, whenever he turned the, the, uh, the rivers into blood, so did these cats. And whenever he brought forth the plague of, of, of frogs, uh, so did these magicians. And so whenever we look at this, we, it suggests to us that in the last days there will be spiritual leaders who are in so in touch with demons that they will somehow, some way, counterfeit and duplicate miracles of God, but instead of pointing people to Jesus, they will point people to themselves. you got to be on lookout. you got to be watching. There will be millions of people that will believe this deception and follow them. The greater point is the false teachers of Paul's day... And the false teachers of Moses' day and the false teachers of our day, they're all cut from the same cloth, y'all. They've been around a long time. But realize their success is limited and it is temporary. We know that from verse 9. It is not going to be around forever because God will make it clear. If this is all we have to look forward to, then how are we going to live? What are we going to do? How are we going to survive these savage days that are coming our way? Verse 10 emphasizes that Christians, believers in Jesus, have got to be different. Look at it. Now, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and suffering, such as happened to me at... This godly person looks like from our text right here. First of all, they have nothing to hide. You hear me? They have nothing to hide. He says, you know my conduct. Watch me. Folks, you want to know what your preacher's conduct is? (coughs) Find out who he's doing business with. Find out who he hangs out with and find out what his conduct is outside of this pulpit. Guys, I have nothing to hide. I get riled up. I cuss sometimes when something don't go my way. I'll tell you that. People say, preacher, you ought not say that. Guys, it's just the truth about it. Sometimes I get wound up over something don't matter. That's just who I am. But I'm telling you, I'm striving every single day not to be that guy with the Lord's help. You want to find out about me? Find out people who I'm doing business with. Make sure I'm going and paying my bills like I ought to. What do you think about that? What do you think about that one? You want to find out about me? Find other people that know me outside of this church and ask them about me. Now listen, you need to ask them after I got saved. Please don't ask them before I got saved. There's some people here today that know me before that. Lord, please don't let them talk. They'll tell you some bad stuff. But that's okay, man. The Lord saved me from it. So a godly leader has nothing to hide. He says, you know my conduct. They also teach the truth. He says, hey, you know my doctrine. You you know my teaching. You have heard it. They will teach you the truth. Folks, whoever's teaching you or leading you or pastoring you, they better be able to back up what it is they say with the Scriptures. Did you hear what I had to say? Anything I preach, you need to be going back and saying, hey, man, is that what that's saying? Number three, they practice what they preach. Do you understand what I'm saying? They practice what they preach. He says, you know my purpose, my faith, my love, my perseverance, my patience. Hey, if you want to see me practicing what I preach, see me whenever it gets bad. If I get up here and say, you know what, it don't matter what the government says. If they want to come in and tell us we ain't going to preach the gospel, I'm going to preach the gospel if i got to be in jail every single week. Y'all better start raising some bail money, I'm telling you. Y'all better come get me out of jail if I get thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. I'll be real ticked off. (laughs) Listen to me. When it comes down to that deal, and I say that that's what it is I'll do, and if I don't do that deal, guess what? I need to be rejected as a teacher because I said this is what I will do. This is what we've been called to do. This is what I'm going to tell you all to do. What I say ought to be backed up by practicing what I preach. Also, they are not afraid of the persecution. He says, look at this. Watch all these things. But you know my persecutions. You know my sufferings. You've seen it. Point is this, and Paul's point is this. Find people like this. Follow them. Encourage them. Be an equipper yourself. Regarding persecution, he points to his own sufferings. In Antioch, he was opposed. In Iconium, they tried to stone him. In Lystra, he was stoned. And he was nearly, I mean, he was left for dead. They thought they killed him. 
But it doesn't matter because he says everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It was going to happen to to Paul and it was going to happen to Timothy and it is going to happen to you if you're going to live a godly life in these crazy times. Look around what's happening to us in our world. Think about it for a second. Sudan, parts of China, Indonesia, Iran, pretty much all Muslim nations... I'm just saying, I know politically correct that they say that it ain't, but it is. Brothers and sisters, those that are in Christ Jesus, just like you, those that you and I will spend an eternity with around the world that suffer for their faith day in and day out. Why do we think of the United States of America that we don't deserve that because we happen to be born here? It's coming. Mark my words. No one gets a free pass for suffering from Jesus. You won't either. A lot of you don't want to swallow that. You don't like that. But guys, I'm telling you, it is the truth. It is happening, and it will happen. And while it's happening, the Bible tells us in verse 13 that evil men, they will go from bad to worse. And they will deceive others and they themselves will be deceived. And he talks about these imposters. Did you catch that? He says evil men will be imposters. And, and this word here, it, 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 it can mean magicians or, or soothsayers or, or even like a jugglers. I think of like the, 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 I don't know if it's three card or five card money and the guy on the city street that's doing all that stuff and trying to, to, to take your money to steal from you. Guys, they claim it's an honest game. They claim that this is the way, but everything is rigged against you. Guys, listen to me. The world is filled with those who want your money and they want your soul but realize buyers need to be where watch what it is someone is teaching you he goes on to say an encouragement this is the way i encourage you today in verse 14 and 15 he says you however continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The strategy of continuing to know what you have learned. Stay the course, y'all. Don't be distracted by, uh, by clever-sounding religious hacks. You hear me? Make sure what they say is word for word what the Bible has to say. Don't believe everybody that comes knocking on your door. Don't believe everything you hear or what everything you read. Something that doesn't line up with the Word of God. So Timothy is to remember both what he has learned and also who taught him the truth. Consider your teachers. Ponder a minute on their character. Think of what it is that they're saying. And finally, let the Word of God make you complete. Look at verse 16. All Scripture, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Listen, verse 15 talks about the sufficiency of God's Word. Verse 16 through 17 tell us about the authority of God's Word. Paul says that all Scripture is inspired by God, or God breathed, some of your translations are going to say. And it means that God breathed through the power of the Holy Spirit out to the words, then that to men, and men wrote those down. And it is the highest possible way that we can look at the Holy Scripture. Because the Bible comes directly from God, it then is able to equip us for every good work. Do you want to know how, what God's will is for your life? Study the Bible. Do you want to fulfill your mission in life? Study the Bible. Do you want to know what God wants you to do? Study the Bible. Do you want to live better? Study the Bible. Do you want freedom from sin? Study the Bible. Do you want God to be pleased with your life? Study the Bible. It will tell you everything you need to know. God's Word tells us what is right. That's teaching. God's Word tells us what is not right. That is reproof. God's Word tells us how to get right. That is correction. And then God's Word tells us how to stay right. That is training in righteousness. Here is the result. That you and I will be thoroughly equipped to do what it is God has called us to do. 
Paul's final deal during these terrible times, to sum up this whole chapter, is this. Know the Word, read the Word, obey the Word. Folks, when you do those three things, guess what? When some hack comes in there and wants to tell you opposite of what you believe, you'd say, no, sir, that does not line up with Scripture. That, my friend, is incorrect. And you know to stay away from that sucker that's trying to teach you something that ain't right. Realize, guys, these times are coming. They're amongst us now. But hear this. If you are in Christ Jesus, you ain't got nothing to be worried about. Yeah, you're going to go through some, t- go through some junk. It's going to be tough. They're going to try to wear you out. But your hope is not in other people. Your hope is not in our government. Your hope is not in our world. Your hope will be found in Jesus Christ. And we will look to Him for all things. And guess what, guys? Old devil and people, they cannot rob that from you. They cannot take that from you. That will be secure in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Hey, I want to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes as I shut up. There's a lot to get through today. I'm going to tell you something. I know a lot of you may be here today, and that's just too much for you. That's, that's just too much of a cost. You, that, you don't want to be a part of that. Hey, I understand there's a lot of people that won't. But there's some of you today that say, you know what, I'm ready to stand. I am ready. I'm ready for those times to come, and I will be tested, and I will be tried. But you know what, I'm going to hold on to Jesus. Man, my encouragement to you today is to continue to pray, continue to read, continue to fellowship with other believers as we go through this deal together. Some of you here this morning, you know that there's a greater purpose for your life. You recognize that that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, like what he said in John chapter 14. And and you're ready to follow him all the days of your life. Hey, you're ready to repent of your sins, and you're ready to turn from him. I'm going to tell you what, guys, if that is you today, and you want to talk to somebody about that, there'll be some folks here at these steps as everybody's heading out them doors. They'd love to minister to you. They'd love to talk to you about what it means to be saved, recognizing that you have sinned, you have done things that God has said not to do. And the only way to get that right is through a right relationship with Jesus Christ, which means we repent of our sins, meaning we turn from our sins and we give them to Jesus. We ask Him to save us from our sins and then we follow Him all the days of our lives. Guys, I'm not telling you about religion. I'm talking about right relationship. I'm talking about being able to be right with God. It only comes through Jesus. Not through church attendance, not through giving of your money, not from volunteering. It, it's strictly 100% through the blood of Jesus we can be reconciled, made right back to God. Maybe this morning you've done that. You know that you have, but you've never taken that first step of discipleship and obedience through baptism. You need to talk to somebody about baptism today. Hey, there'll be some guys here at the steps that would love to talk to you about that as well. Maybe you've got some, 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 some problems, some issues, or some health problems. You want some elders of our church to pray for you. They'll be here as well. They'd love to pray with you, encourage you uh, in that deal. Maybe you want to find out about church membership. Whatever it is you've got going on, don't leave the property without getting it right for the Lord. I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit for doing what it is He does as I pray for you. Lord, I pray, God. <laughs> Lord, that we put our money where our mouth is when it comes to this word. That, Lord, when it sure enough does come, that we will be faithful and that we would stand as a church, Lord God. That we will stand up for truth when everybody wants to lie. That, Lord, we would stand up, Lord, when nobody else will. Your word has empowered us, Lord God. I pray that we would be faithful to it. Direct us with your Holy Spirit. Show us through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would be found faithful in the end, Lord God. Encourage us, equip us for these good works. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We look forward, Lord, to the times that are about to come. And Father, I pray that no one would lose sight, no one would lose hope in the truth that you have given us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Adios, y'all.